today about how the Internet of Things, our favorite marketing buzzard right now, um, is going to change the way we play. And the reason for that is I hear a lot of, go a lot of stuff about IoT um, to the point where the term's getting like, super diluted and confusing. But all everyone ever talks about is how it's going to make us more productive or better at our jobs or stuff. But that's no fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to know how it's going to change like, fun stuff. Before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm a developer advocate at Firebase. Um, Firebase is one of those platform as a service companies. Uh, we focus on real time, so like millisecond synchronization between clients. And as a developer advocate, um, I found a job where people pay me to help other people have trouble with code. So they go and they cause trouble building neat stuff. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. So this is an example of some of that trouble. So I was going to have an agenda, but then I realized my agenda had an interesting uh, a pattern. Um, so I decided to present it as a haiku. <laughs> what is this play stuff? Play loves technology too. A demo, robots fight. Um, and I had something that didn't fit. Uh, because the word will is in my uh, title, I have to speculate a little bit, right? So I'll be speculating at the end. It's a bonus stuff. So let's talk a little bit about play. Um, play is uh, something bees do when they're not busy working. So for bears, when they're not busy finding food, I guess, because that's all the work they really do, are finding other bears to yep. do something else with, um, they play. And we see this throughout the animal kingdom. It's something that's kind of like, like universal among like higher level life forms on our planet. And uh, as humans, being sophisticated organisms, we've come up with very sophisticated play. From uh, my favorite game, Drink the Beer. <laughs> uh, and even more sophisticated, uh, like, uh, I think this is a Warhammer set for uh, Napoleonic Battles, uh, which is about the most sophisticated play I've ever encountered in my life. <laughs> Do lots of different kinds of play. It's a huge, broad topic. But I need to focus a little bit, because I only have like a half hour up here. Um, so I'm going to focus on a couple of different areas of play. First one is I'm going to tell you a story about sport, and I'll explain why on the next slide particularly about fencing, uh, which actually reminds me, are there any fencers in the audience? Okay. Okay, okay sorry, <coughs> I'm gonna be making a lot of mistakes. Uh, you, can, you can yell at me afterwards. Uh -oh. oh, yay, awesome. Um, and then, of course, this is a beer-themed conference to some extent, so I'm gonna focus on games that we can play safely while, while drunk or drinking, because uh, FAA is not one of them. <laughs> so why, am I, why do I wanna talk about sports first? Because that has nothing to do with beer. Uh, they're kind of a canary in the coal mine uh, for a lot of kind of the developments on how we play. And that's because like athletes are kind of crazy. I do, I'm an athlete, I, I actually play roller derby, um, and uh, what I've witnessed about athletes around me is they're always looking for that edge, and they're, they're like almost fanatical about it, even at the amateur levels. They're really, really, it's really important that they stay ahead of the competitors. Um, and this means that they're going to adopt everything early, whether it makes sense or not. We'll adopt like magic things that someone talks about, and if it if it works, great. If it doesn't, well, at least like it didn't work for their competitor first. So let's talk about one particular sport where technology, um, the development of technology in the past has had a really big impact on the way people play that sport. And we're going to talk about fencing, particularly FA fencing. So um, FA, um, for my very very short period of time, fencing, uh, it, it's it is one of three kinds of fencing. Um, it's a standard move and, and, and a standard way to get a point in FA is to actually kind of poke poke your opponent, um, and uh, a long time ago, uh, before technology influenced it, uh, there were some challenges with it. It was very hard to determine when people actually scored, um, to the point where they would put like fish hook-like things on the ends of their swords, and when they poked, they would actually like, you know, big, get big old snags in people's fabric, and then they had two judges sitting there staring at them on each side, waiting, watching for these snags to happen. And it was a big challenge. Um, but people still did it because it was a lot of fun. But then um, invention came around, and the thing called the electric FA was invented. And uh, what it, how it works is there's this little kind of push button. I'll use my laser. There's a little push button in the front, and then um, it connects down to uh, through the sword to the base where there's a wire that goes back and plugs into a computer. And then you can tell not only um, when someone has made legal contact. But you can also tell um, who made contact first, um, if that's relevant, you can actually get ties on um, contact and update, but uh, it just gives a lot more information. This is critically important because there's one thing I want to frame. Foil fencing is the chest and the arm and the head. Epe is the entire body. Toe to head. 
Yeah. So uh, you can touch anything, the wrist, the arm, to contribute. And if anything, including even the, the, the other person's guard, I believe. Yes, yes. And it is a difficult but legal hitting zone. And this is one of the other reasons the differences between this and foil, which is the more traditional kind of like, um, or the fencing that most people think of when they hear the word fencing. Um, and and uh, in foil, the, uh, a lot of uh, differentiation between scoring is actually drive by who has the right of way. So if you've parried, even if you get hit after you parry, you still have the advantage. Uh, F8 doesn't really have that. So it was like really hard to score. So you, you take these swords, you plug them into a computer, and now all of a sudden, um, it's changed the way people train. Because like before, when you had to train, you had to get this whole crew of brass together, which makes it much harder to train. And it got easier to train. People used it in training. And then a few years later, um, people started using it in competitions. So here we can see it being used in competitions. And once it started getting used in competitions, it started influencing the strategy of the game. There was a certain move uh, called the flick, which is basically kind of like whipping your, your uh, up around the other person's parry to get the poke in um, that was not as useful before, but once this um, electronic computerized scoring came into play, it became much more common, to the point where if you type in FA fencing into Google image search, you're going to see image after image of somebody with a curved sword poking the other person, a curved uh, FA, um, because it's like, it just almost, yeah, it's a very, very common move now. And, um, yeah, so this even continued to influence it. And then a few years later, like, even the Olympics were impacted. And I guess that's kind of when, when the whole sport has changed, I guess. Right? Okay, so you want my help on this slide. Yes. These are foil fencers. These are foil fencers. Oh, no. You see the, you see the chest targets? Yes. See how he's got a, a silver chest target on? Yes. And he's going for the chest of the other gentleman. You see how the bell of his wrist, uh, wrist guard is much smaller than an epee? Yeah. So these gentlemen are actually doing foil fencing. And it's kind of cheesy of a foil fencer to do a flick. Because you have, to, you have to only go for a small target. You, I'm being really corny here, right, for fun. But like a, a real epee fencer goes for the toe, then the head, then the shoulder, and the wrist. And that sequence kind of takes their opponent <coughs> sequentially. And this guys are, these guys are foil fencers. The, the idea that he's doing a flick is very, very, uh, it's corny. Corny. Oh, there's a corny foil flick. Yeah. Which unfortunately comes up when you Google image search for FAA flick. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't seen this in 10 years. It's fantastic. So thank you very much. You're welcome. But um, we actually saw it like, start to influence the Olympics. And there has to be a fencer in the room, right? Always has to be. Which is awesome. So here's actually a picture of this. Uh, being used for the first time at the Olympics. They actually had to move it inside because it started to rain and the electronics of the day um, were not ready for it. And to give you an idea of how early this was and how early the sport was impacted, yes, those are Nazis in the back of the picture. Um, this was the 1936 Olympics. Um, so technology has been influencing the way we play for a very long time, um, way, way, way back. And it continues to. And it influences other kinds of play, other than sports too. Okay, so now I've established technology can influence the way we play, and it continues to. What is this Internet of Things, and what does it have to do with this conversation? So this Internet of Things is like this incredibly overloaded marketing buzzword. It kind of reminds me of like how cloud was being used a couple years ago, where it meant like everything that was sellable in certain spaces. Um, but uh, at least for the, for the sake of this talk, what I mean is non-traditional computing devices that are aware of the Internet. And by that, I mean they can actually do an Internet stack and connect out to servers themselves, even if they're not routable themselves. Um, and it's best if they can actually do that securely, um, which we're starting to see, little tiny things that can actually have enough oomph to use SSL. And it's actually something that's been going on for years. Um, like I would say that smartphones are kind of the, the, one of the first things that happened here, is we had these, these pocket phones, and all of a sudden, before we knew it, uh, we had the information to the, or access to the world's information in our hand at any given time. Uh, which definitely changed the way people play pub trivia. But um, this is starting to happen in more and more places now. Now it doesn't have to be an $800 phone in your pocket. It's getting cheaper and easier than ever. And uh, there's a lot of potential behind like having stuff that's, that's this internet of thing versus just like electronic. Like right now I can go and I can buy a soccer ball um, uh, that has a little sensor in it that synchronizes with Bluetooth to my iPhone. I can buy a tennis racket little thing that snaps on. Um, like about all these devices, and uh, except right now a lot of them uh, only have enough electronics and enough battery um, to do like a Bluetooth connection, which is cool, but it's not really IoT-ish yet because they're still working through another device, which results in these like support net matrix nightmares um, where like 
if I want to test that tennis racket dongle with, um, if I want it to be available to everyone, I can test it with hundreds or thousands of phones. Hundreds of thousands of other devices that can actually get that data onto the internet. And this is where the network effect can kind of help IoT make magic happen, is once everything can kind of get data out there using the internet, almost anything else can consume that data. So now we've, we've moved uh, from beyond just dealing with the fabric of the communication and having to deal with like low level bits moving back and forth, and we moved on to actually figuring out the language and the way, the kind of information things want to communicate to be useful. Another way of looking at it is this beautiful um, picture of a network stack. Um, whereas previously, like, with, with all those kind of single purpose devices, when you're building for them, you have to focus way on the bottom of this, this kind of stack. You focus on like, the very fundamental ways that those devices communicate. You have to establish the link, you have to figure out how you're gonna be marshalling data back and forth and transporting it. Um, but once everything kind of speaks internet, like a lot of the stack is taken care of and we can spend almost all of our time focusing up at the top. Uh, just focusing on where does that data go. Uh, and one thing that makes this really easy is the proliferation of cloud services. Uh, we have <coughs> databases in the cloud everywhere, and it's very easy, you know, if I can have a little IoT device communicate with that, I can also make um, my laptop and my phone and other IoT devices communicate with that cloud API. It makes it much easier and allows us to focus on more challenging problems. Here's an example of how easy it is. See if this still works. I've taken um, my favorite game, Rock'em Sock'em Robots, and uh, I put some buttons on them, like the, the kind of buttons you find in a little electronic starter kit. And uh, it's now an internet of thing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see if it's still, still running, otherwise I might need to, to reset some processes. Does anyone like to come up and play a game? <laughs> now, but I can show everyone after the talk. So, um... She beat me, by the way. <laughs> I don't know, it might have been a tie. To show you, like, why this is interesting, uh, this was really easy to put together. It still worked. So, here's, a, here's, here's the, just the amount of work I had to do. So, like, in terms of the actual hardware, it's just a couple of little buttons and they paint to the base of their heads. They go back to the, the GPI on Raspberry Pi, which is this kind of ubiquitous um, mini computer that work. And uh, then on that uh, Raspberry Pi, I, uh, I added some code to make the robots communicate with the internet. And I used this really cool library called Johnny5 that makes it super easy to build Node.js robots. And uh, all I actually had to write was, um, I had to connect to one of those cloud services. I picked Firebase, um, so they'd let me work on this while I was at work. Um, <laughs> and then I just took those two GPIO inputs and set listeners up on them. So that when they go up, when the head pops up, the button opens, and I get an up signal, and then I go and I grab the previous score for the opposing robot, and then I add one to it, and that's it. So it's all this on the robot. And then for the client, which is implemented in uh, everyone's favorite sports scoreboard client, Slide Deck, uh, the Slide Deck is they're just running this code. What it does is it connects to that same little internet uh, cloud service, that same Firebase, and it just has listeners for a few things. It listens for changes to that score, and then it just updates the value in the slide, and it listens for uh, the reset button. The reset button. It's robots did not. And this is one of the cool things, is these two, these two pieces of code don't really have any specific thing that connects them other than the data it's using to represent the, the robot match. Um, it's just become very data centric. There's, uh, the, the robots know nothing about the fact that I'm using a laptop to view it, and the slide deck knows nothing about the fact that I'm using robots to, to set that score. 
So um, this could be applied to any kind of hunt. You know, it'd be really easy to roll an Android app, a Google Glass app, make an LED scoreboard, whatever. Uh, and what this means is, because this only took me like 10 lines of code, is when I'm building my games, I can start to focus on more interesting things. I can start to focus on what rules um, that didn't make sense without the internet are a lot more fun now. Or I can make this an MMO robot, Rock'em Sock'em Robots game. Stuff like that. I guess it's time for me to speculate, right? Okay, so I made some Rock'em Sock'em Robots to connect to the internet. What's the big deal? Well, this is kind of the beginning of our, of our ability to take a lot of concepts that were really successful in video games and made them super addictive and apply them to other real life games. Um, one of my favorite being the, uh, the tutorial. So when you get a new game now, um, a long time ago you used to read the instruction manual. And then sometime around the early 90s, um, this is from a Super Nintendo game, uh, it was one of the first games I saw one of these tutorials in, um, the game teaches you to play itself, which is cool. It makes video games super accessible and fun to learn. Uh, now we're at a stage where if, if, de if devices are aware of where you're playing them, um, and like for example, like a, a football that knows when first downs happen and stuff like that, you can, you can actually use the game itself and the, the pieces in that game to teach you about the game, which makes games more accessible and more fun for people to play. Uh, I also think there's going to be a rise of what I've started to call MMOLARPGS, which stands for... Uh, <laughs> Molar, for sure, right? <laughs> Massively Multiplayer Online Live Action Role Playing Games. <laughs> and uh, the first one I think that really satisfies this is Ingress. Do we have any Ingress people around? Any Enlightened people? Oh, one. Okay, I thought I might be the only one. So um, the way Ingress works, uh, for those of you who do not play, is it is a giant capture the flag game where you run around um, to different cool landmarks, like in this case the Eiffel Tower, taken from one of their official screenshots. And um, these are like little points that you go and you kind of capture and you build these networks um, for your side and you try and blow up the virtual networks for the other side. Um, and it's actually a global playing field. So at any given time there are uh, like People playing Ingress all over the world, and the things that people do in one part of the world impacts other parts of the world. And it's a really fun game, especially like while you're traveling, because you see you find, end up finding all these pieces of public artwork you never knew were there. So I recommend it. Um, but what it does is it kind of captures a lot of the things that made MMOs really fun, that social aspect. The aspect that you have a guild, that you have a group, that you get together and you rent a bus and put a waffle iron in it and have like a road trip of 50 people playing a game all at once. Um, Except instead of that being a virtual bus in an MMO game, it's now a real physical bus. And you're actually having real interactions with people. And real waffles. And real waffles, which is awesome. Yeah, if you ever rent a bus for an MMO LARPG, I recommend the Waffle Iron. It makes all the difference. <laughs> and I, I see a rise in this happening with, with uh, the novel interfaces that, that can be accomplished with, with IoT. Um, and with things that can be get, uh, permanent game pieces, like those landmarks. Um, being interconnected themselves. So what does this result in? This results in, uh, this is a picture of like the Utopia from The Simpsons, uh, which usually happens whenever the family leaves town. Um, there's always one thing these pictures have in common is they have a bunch of people playing outside as the camera pans across. So what I'm hopeful for is that now that we uh, can kind of capture the things that make a lot of the games that make us sedentary um, more active and more social, um, that we're going to be able to uh, uh, kind of achieve this with our internet-connected baseball diamonds, internet-connected bicycles, and apparently internet-connected maples. So people will finally be outside, and people will not be as concerned, and now video games will no longer be associated with anything negative, except children's fun, which is positive. But wait, there's more. I think one other cool thing that's going to come out of this is um, there's a lot of these kind of like kits for kids um, that adults use too. I like these things a lot also. Um, for building things, like Lego Mindstorms. A really easy way to build robots. And they're cool, um, but I haven't really encountered any that do, that you can really do a lot with. Like Lego Mindstorms is really fun, except no matter what I ended up going um, uh, with my plan, I always ended up building something that was kind of like a crab. <laughs> so I can make a crab that could walk, I can make a crab that could dance. Um, that was about the limit of what I could do with the sensors and other stuff on it. But once these kinds of technologies suddenly know about the internet, know about data, know about sensor networks that already exist, they can do a whole lot more. They can interact with each other easily without having to worry about like Bluetooth transports and that kind of stuff. Um, they can interact with people who happen to be carrying internet connected devices with them at all times. Um, you know, your, your crowd like robot can come and greet you at the door because it knows that you've just arrived from your blockatron or from your um, cell phone in your pocket and its geolocation. 
And I think that this is going to be a really great technology to try and uh, solve the problem I'm seeing. Um, the problem I'm seeing right now is that a lot of people, more people than ever are using technology, but because technology is so sophisticated, fewer than ever people actually really understand the technology they're using. So there's people out there using smartphones and playing games from a very young age, but like it's kind of like magic to a lot of them because it's just almost irreducibly complex. Like I don't know how that radio works in the cell phone. That's like it's like magic. How much? How does that data go through so fast? Um, but having toys that you can break apart and find the components of and have under have understandable blocks, I'm hoping will be kind of a gateway um, robot uh, into uh, teaching people that you know this computer science stuff, this technology, it is understandable. It's not magic. And you'll actually be able to tackle it. And you know, if you've built a few robots as a kid like this, a lot of other concepts you have to tackle later in life are a lot easier. And, you know, comp sci is a lot more fun later on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, questions for Jenny. Oh, no, I got one. In, in terms of, um, so the rock and sock robots are awesome. Are there other things that you've connected? Are there other things that you play with, you know, besides like mind storms and so on? Are there other, you know, for folks that are looking to do that, are there other sort of obvious projects to work on? Are there other obvious projects to work on to play with IoT stuff? Usually, um, it's a good question. Um, usually, I, I have something that's physical that I want to display or do something I want to instrument. Um, so I usually focus around the physical problem I'm trying to make better or solve. Um, so I, haven't, I can't think of any kind of obvious first ones. Usually, uh, like Rock'em Sock and Robots, I just walk through the board game section and I'm like, what thing am I going to be able to, to tape stuff onto that I can get through the TSA security people without them taking it away? It won't look like a bomb. Um, and uh, that, that one just stuck out. So usually I just go and try and pull things and, and play with them. But it, what's really cool is there are actually a lot of dev boards now that are, are finally able to accomplish that um, combination of internet connectivity and secure communication, like the, the new Intel Edison board, um, which is on pre-order now, looks like it might make a lot of this stuff even easier than using uh, a Raspberry Pi and, and our, uh, in combination with an Arduino sometimes. So I think it's certainly, as you're talking about, we use these massive cell phones that even we don't know how they work. That sounds exactly like the classic science fiction story of the future of society where everything's automated and when things break, they just get a new one until they run out of them. Uh, because nobody in the society is no longer ocean. How can we address that in a larger picture other than, you know, we need more STEM education and we you know, need examples of the, the Lego robots that you can easily pick apart, right? There's got to be more to that for at least, you know, the, the people who work in the future related to technology. It really matters to us a lot. I mean, the rest of the world doesn't really matter, but it matters to us and we're still not understanding that. So in short, how do we avoid the future, the, the ominous future of idiocracy when no one knows how anything works at all? I think a lot of it comes back to making it fun. Um, because like the vast majority of people who do, who code out there are beginners. It's like, I've seen stats where it's like 90 plus percent of people are, are beginners. And it's very easy uh, for uh, stuff that's very easy to us can be very challenging for them. Um, and people will, will start to drop off whenever they hit one of those cliffs. Um, so what I try and do is I try and find ways to express things in fun ways but also to build technology such that it's easy to use. Um, and then try to communicate to those people through media, through in-person interactions, um, that this stuff is something they can understand. And uh, that's one reason I really love like, a lot of the libraries that are coming out for robotics now, um, and like Arduino. Um, it just, just has made this stuff so much easier and so much easier to digest. And once people understand that stuff, it's much easier for them to vaguely understand, they're like, oh, this is just the, the cell phone I have. It's just an extremely fast version of the Arduino with a really powerful radio in it. Um, yeah, so kind of, I try and break things down and, and find ways to make it fun. So, so you're doing, on that point, one of the things, because I've been trying to teach artists how to use embedded technology on Arduinos and graduate lives to do kind of interactive art. And the thing that I, I find that's hard for me is that I have to remember to forget 99% of the details and try to get the concept, like explaining radio communications as just basically Morse code. That's running really, 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 really fast. They don't need to understand all the encoding systems and, and things like that to understand all of that, right? Um, the other thing I found really useful is there's a company like Evil Mad Science Labs um, that makes lots of kits and things like that. One of the things they did is they took um, some of the classic integrated circuits and blew them up to like eight by 10 size circuits. So like a five-by-five five, five timer, which is kind of the classic 
timer that's inside a lot of things is made out of individual transistors and resistors and capacitors. And you just explain to you, like, this is what's inside of there. It just keeps getting smaller and smaller. But what it is is very simple, right? Because that's what I think confuses people is nothing inside an iPhone is particularly complicated. There's just a nearly infinite amount of simple things going on rather than a smaller, complicated thing. That's what's worked for me. And then that people get their heads around the basic concept. And they want to understand quadrature encoding and all of that other stuff that happens in radio. Fine, you can go dig into that, but it doesn't really matter how Bluetooth works or how. You know, Bluetooth is just a serial ca cable that's invisible. It's just matter. Well, no, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I believe uh, it's just very deep between that. It's fine. There's an artist of large setting, especially with advanced technology, is indistinguishable from magic, right? So, it's kind of a, I guess, it's a well, it's a woman in tech question. Um, so I do a conference called Thema in, I guess I'm wearing a t-shirt, in London. And one of the things when I was looking for speakers in the last conference was I found this cluster of really cool women doing no robots in the States. But I couldn't find an equivalent in London. And it was sort of disappointing because I really wanted to like, are you, are you, are you, you? And what was your gateway into this? And how can we get more uh, no robot women? because it's, it's, it's immature. And um, like for, for me, I kind of completely independently of the rest of the community discovered it. Because a long time ago, I used to do robotics uh, back in like the early days of Kegbot, when it was really hard. Um, I actually burned out on it. I was like, ah, oh, this robot stuff's not fun. I don't want to do it. I'll go work in like enterprise software or something. It's more fun. <laughs> 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 were more fun at the time, which kind of gives you a set some context for how bad the tooling was back then. And um, then, uh, you know, I was like, when I heard about like this, this Arduino stuff coming, I got oh, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then finally I picked it up and then um, I wanted to connect it to the internet. So I just did web searches for like, how do I get an Arduino on the internet? And then like notebots came up um, in search and then my mind was blown when I tried to write my first one. It's just so much easier. And I think some of the reason it hasn't really proliferated very far is because it's still kind of new. Um, and just not enough of those C people have discovered it in the JavaScript communities uh, abroad yet. Um, but it is really, like, it's really cool and it's amazingly easy to make pretty powerful robot stuff. Um, people, I think people just need to find out and they need to get the dev kits in their hand. Because uh, I'm lucky enough to be in San Francisco that when I wanted to do this project, I was like, oh, I need, uh, for my first one, I actually needed some analog inputs. So I was like, I need like, an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi, and I only had to, without any pre-planning, I only had to walk about 10 feet to find both of them. <laughs> um, in my office. They were just sitting in the supply closet with a note on it. This is my personal Raspberry Pi. Use it for your projects. Like, okay. Um, and I don't think that that has really hit the other areas as much. I think it's a combination of NodeBots are just too new still right now. It's still kind of an emerging topic. And that uh, the, the availability, vast ubiquity of these dev boards is kind of still geographically isolated. Um, which is a shame because they're really cheap. Yeah, I just wanted to throw out something. There's a guy named Dan Shapiro who's a Google alumni. I think he's 
created this game called Robot Turtles. Did you hear about this on Kickstarter? Robot Turtles. Just check it out. Just check it out. You, you'd love it, Jenny. It's really cool. It's a board game for kids along the lines of what we were talking about on this side the earlier questions. But it's about making learning technology programs fun for kids. It's super cool. You'd like it.